Well, hi there, and welcome to our Bible study on 2 Corinthians on the Lighthouse Discord server. We are on our very last chapter, and it's not a long study today. But before we begin, let's just open with a word of prayer. Father, our subject today, starting with 2 Corinthians 13.1, the title is to examine ourselves or examine yourselves. And so, Father, today the passage of scripture as I go to pray that hits me is this from Psalm 139. And it talks, Lord, about how, excuse me, how you've searched me. This is, of course, the Psalm of David. And how you've known me. You know when I sit and when I rise up, you understand my thought from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O oh Lord, you know it. You have enclosed me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain to it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand will lay hold of me. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me and the light around me will be night, even the darkness is not dark to you, and the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are a light to you. For you form my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me when as yet there was not one of them. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would outnumber the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. So Lord, those 18 verses of Psalm 139, I ask God that those verses would apply to all those in desperate need on the server and represented by others on the server. You know the four people that we've been praying for who are battling cancer. You know those people who have had other health challenges. You know the individual, our staff, one staff person, whose family is sick after coming home from camp. You know the details of every single life. You know who needs work. You know who needs provision. You know who needs more of you and so today god as i prayed or read and prayed these verses i pray lord that you would reach into each situation and that your will would be done and i ask god that for those who are in the study tonight and i ask lord god for those who will be listening to this later that these couple of verses would reach into our souls and change us and renew us and draw us closer to you. Verse 23 of Psalm 139. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there be any hurtful way in me and lead me in the ever lasting way we give you all the praise we give you all the glory we give you all the thanksgiving in your holy name we pray dear jesus amen 
So the title, the subtitle of 2 Corinthians 13 is Examine Yourselves. And this is Paul speaking. And he writes, this is the third time I am coming to you. Every fact is to be confirmed by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Now, I don't know about any of you. If you've ever filed a police report or if you've ever had to go to court for anything, people want eyewitness accounts, right? People want written statements. They might want dash cam or they want video, whether it be security or video taken from a phone or a camera or whatever, but they always want witnesses to cooperate the story in order to prove it. Well, in Jewish times and in the times of scripture, testimony by at least one or two or three other people were counted as gold, if you will. Because, of course, they didn't have pictures back then, right? So it's interesting, and I remember this from one of our other studies, that when Jesus was being questioned, he used God the Father as his witness, which, of course, caused an uproar. But it was true, because God is with Jesus. So... Moving on to verse two, I have previously said when present the second time, and though now absent, I say in advance to those who have sinned in the past and to all the rest as well, that if I come again, I will not spare anyone. Since you are seeking for the proof or for proof of the Christ who speaks in me and who is not weak toward you but mighty in you for indeed he was crucified because of weakness yet he lives because of the power of god for we also are weak in him yet will we will live with him because of the power of god directed toward you test yourself test yourselves to see if you are in the faith examine yourself or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless, indeed, you fail the test. But I trust that you will realize that we ourselves do not fail the test. Now, we pray to God that you do no wrong. Not that we ourselves may appear approved, but that you may do what is right, even though we may appear unapproved. For we can do nothing against the truth, but only for the truth. For we recognize when we ourselves are weak, but you are strong. This we also pray for that you may be made complete. For this reason, I am writing these things while absent, so that when present, I need not use severity in accordance with the authority which the Lord gave me for building up and not for tearing down. Finally, brethren, rejoice. Be made complete. Be comforted. Be like-minded. Live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. And then the last verse, 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So that's Second Corinthians, which we know is actually the fourth book. So why don't we have the others? Because they, for whatever reason, were not kept in history. So the first six verses, and I'm going to read it again, but this time it'll be in the New King James. What I read was NASB. This will be the third time I'm coming to you. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. 
I have told you before and foretell as if I were present the second time and now being absent, I write to those who have sinned before, excuse me, and to all the rest, that if I come again, I will not spare. Since you seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, who is not weak towards you, but mighty in you. For though he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God towards you. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know, or sorry, do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. But I trust that you will know that we are not disqualified. See, friends, here Paul left no doubt that he would become bolstered by his full apostolic authority to set things in order in Corinth. With those who were still in a spiritual state of unrepentant sin, Paul was going to deal finally and decisively and said, I will not spare you. The implication here is like your leaders who have been unwilling to do what needs to be done. And what needed to be done was good old fashioned church discipline as outlined in the book, sorry, in Matthew chapter 18 and in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. See, those who were unrepentant needed to be put out of the church in the hope that then they would finally come to their senses, repent, and then be restored to the fellowship. Now, that sounds tough. And it sounds unloving. And it sounds unforgiving. But these people were causing such disturbance in the church gathering. And of course, church refers to the people, not to the building. But when there's that much discrepancy and that much disturbance, that much chaos happening, the Bible speaks about what we should be doing. And we just read last week in 2 Corinthians 12, 21, I am afraid God will make me ashamed when I visit you again. I will feel like crying because many of you have never given up your old sins. You are still doing things that are immortal, indecent, and shameful. Well, the fact is they weren't going to be permitted to do immoral, indecent, and shameful things once Paul arrived. Now, I'm going to tell you honestly, I was in a church where something was going on that was harmful. Was it something so, so bad that people could get really hurt by it? Well, perhaps not. At least not everyone in the church. But I will tell you that those individuals who were involved were extremely hurt. And one of the families left the church over it because it was not dealt with properly. And it's devastating to me that this was allowed to happen, but it wasn't in my scope to say anything about it. On the server, on the other hand, it is. And occasionally, like this morning, we come across someone who claims to be a Christian and then puts up a profile picture that is so absolutely vile that the admins are typing to each other and wasn't even me that noticed it at first. And it was like, what do we do? We need to deal with this. Well, you know what? You read the rules and we have to take a stand for Jesus. Now it might seem like we are too strict, but there's something about walking with the Lord that, yes, we might make an honest mistake from time to time, but when we blatantly go against God's word, that 
is a whole other issue. So we need to encourage each other. And Paul was in a situation where he was the leader. He was overseeing this church. He was teaching them. And if the slam on him was that his letters are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech is contempt contemptible, and that comes from 2 Corinthians 10.10, 10, so they blew him off as an inconsequential bag of wind. But they were in for a shock. For just as Christ was crucified when he was weak and bloodied, but now lives by the power of God, so Paul was beaten into a weakened state, but would soon arrive in the power of God. And no longer would it be business as usual in the church in Corinth. Now, it's been an undercurrent of thought throughout First and Second Corinthians that there were times when church discipline is mandated. Whenever church leaders choose to appease the sinners in their church by essentially giving them a pass on their sins, the inevitable result will be to recreate Corinth in all of its sin-sick impotence. Have a read of Corinthians. If you have not listened to all of the study on these two books, go back, please, and listen. Learn about the sickness of this church. And the core issue was this. There were too many members of the church in Corinth who thought they were saved when truly they were not. So Paul put them to the test. Paul didn't judge them here. Make, I'm making this clear, and neither am I. But Paul put them to the test. He said in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless you indeed are disqualified? You see, since many of these individuals were living as if Christ was absent from their lives, Paul feared, and rightly so, that they weren't Christians at all. You see, friends, receiving Christ as our Lord and Savior, believing in him, accepting him, along with that comes repentance from our sins a turning away, a renouncing of our sins. And this is one of the difficulties that we come across sometimes. So Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you were gathered together, along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus, dot, dot, dot. But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. 1 Corinthians 5, verses 4 to 5, and then verse 11. John MacArthur Jr. wrote this. Our Lord's words about eternal life were invariably accompanied by warnings to those who might be tempted to take salvation light. He taught that the cost of following him is high, that the way is narrow and few find it. He said, many who call him Lord will be forbidden from entering the kingdom of heaven. Have a look at Matthew 7, verses 13 to 23. Present day evangelicalism, by and large, ignores those warnings. The prevailing view of what constitutes saving faith continues to grow broader and more shallow. 
while the portrayal of Christ in preaching and witnessing becomes fuzzy. Anyone who claims to be a Christian can find evangelicals willing to accept a profession of faith, whether or not the person's behavior shows any evidence of commitment to Christ. And you see, friends, this is one of the reasons when somebody accepts Christ on the server that I take it very seriously and I try to disciple. I try to include people in Bible studies. I've created, you know, what, um, you know, a channel about knowing Jesus, a channel about what being born again is, a channel um, on basic Christianity. And more than that, theological information i try to answer questions and i pray but there's only so much we can do online people really need to get into an active church in real life so is our behavior showing any evidence of commitment to christ now i can't speak for you I can only speak for myself. Have I made mistakes? You bet I have. Because we all do. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23. But that doesn't mean that we have to sit and wallow in our sin. And that is key. So what's Paul's summary statement? In verses 7 to 10. He writes, now I pray to God that you do no evil. Not that we should appear approved, but that you should do what is honorable. Though we may seem disqualified, for we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. For we are glad when we are weak and you are strong. And this also we pray that you may be made complete. Therefore, I write these things being absent, lest being present, I should use sharpness according to the authority which the Lord has given me for edification and not for destruction. You see, in most of his letters, Paul wrote a declarative statement in which he defined his purpose in writing his letter. And you could kind of call it Paul's theme. For inst or sorry, for example, the theme version of Romans is Romans 1, verse 16. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Now, there was a discussion that happened last night about salvation and predestination and all of that. And yet here it says that it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, not just the elected few. You see, everything in the book of Romans explains, applies, illustrates, or amplifies that verse. And as another example, when Paul wrote Timothy, he stated his purpose in 1 Timothy 3.15. If I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. By the same token, Paul's theme, his verse, for all of 2 Corinthians can be found in 2 Corinthians 13, 10, where Paul wrote, I write these things being absent, lest being present, I should use sharpness, according to the authority which the Lord has given me for edification and not for destruction. You see, in light of that desire, Paul literally prayed that the Corinthians would not do what was wrong by refusing his correction as spelled out in his letter. Because as we've seen, even though Paul was planning to confront any sin issues he found in the church, he truly didn't want to. His hope was that when he arrived, he would discover much to his delight that he would not need to demonstrate his apostolic authority. 2 Corinthians 13, 7, do the right thing before we come. Only time would tell if his prayers would be answered. As a church leader, 
of which I'm not, but the leader of, of the Lighthouse Discord server. I can assure you from talking with pastors across the years, across the decade, and I haven't been a pastor anywhere as long as many people have, I can assure you that no pastor wants to ever have to be the person who would demonstrate his apostolic authority. Pastors want to love on people. Pastors want to share the gospel message with people. Pastors do not want to have to discipline. But when the church people belie Christ, go against the Bible and sin, sometimes there's no other choice. And whether you're the senior pastor of the church, whether you're the youth pastor, the associate pastor, or a member of the board or of elders or the board or council, it is not an easy job. So what am I saying to everyone who might ever listen to this in years to come? Examine yourselves. Make sure you are right with Christ, please. And don't put someone else into the position of having to come down on you for the sin that you know you should not be doing. Now, the last few verses. Finally, brethren, farewell. Become complete. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. You see, friends, Paul was about to bid adieu to the church in Corinth. And sadly, so are we. But the bottom line to all of this is summarized quite nicely by the Apostle Paul. God desperately desires that his church become complete or mature. God longs for all of us to be of one mind, to live in peace with him intimately involved with and deeply connected to the lives of our churches, of our gatherings, of our server, of our fellowship with one another. Indeed, this is so vitally important to God that every member of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, shares in this deep desire that our churches, our gatherings, manifest to our communities the obvious truth that God loves us, that Jesus Christ is gracious towards us, and that the Holy Spirit directly communes with us. See, friends, that's what church is all about. That's what church has always been about. Let's pray. Lord, I know that there's a lot of miscommunication, a lot of heresy, a lot of schisms, chasms, disagreements within various factions within the Christian body. And yet we're all members of the body of Christ. Doesn't matter where we come from. Doesn't matter what denomination we support. It doesn't matter about all the specific details of our beliefs. What matters is that we examine ourselves, that our walk with you is as pure as we know how to be, and that we give our lives to you daily to help us be pure, loving, unified, and following the commandment to love you with all we have, and to love others as ourselves. And so, Lord, I pray you would help us to do that. 
thank you for this study on Corinthians and on the Corinthian church. And I pray, Lord God, that none of our churches would be like this Corinthian church. Cause us all to take a long, good, hard look at who we are in you and draw us closer to you and help us, Lord, to walk more closely with you. In your holy name we pray, dear Jesus. Amen.